Buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches. Good morning. Good afternoon, good evening. This is a conversation as part of Crafting Futures Project. My name is Alejandra Misrai. I work at the National University of Tucumán and I'm here in representation of Reddit, the inter-university network for uh, clothing and textile um, design. This is a project undertaken with seven national universities. The British Council is also a member of this program. This conversation is part of this program, Crafting Futures. Our intervention today has to do with the context of the Fashion Revolution Week, in which we are going to launch this conversation as part of the pre-launch of a publication on which we've been working uh, We've been a multitude of people working throughout uh, the Argentinian territory, not only in Argentina, but also in India. There has been lots of people engaged in this project. And as part of this publication called Voices of Craftsmanship, uh, we are here together with different uh, female actors uh, who have participated in several ways. And uh, first of all, I would like to introduce you to Carrie Somers. Uh, she is also one of the, our hosts as part of the Fashion Revolution Week. Carrie is a designer, a social entrepreneur, and an activist, and the co-founder of the Fashion Revolution Week. Uh, Fashion Revolution. Thank you so much, Carrie, for this. Thank you for this invite. Uh, we also have Ritu Seti, uh, the founder of the Craft Revival Trust and a consultant and a collaborator in this program. As well, we have uh, Celeste Valero, a textile craftswoman and the member of Tejedores Andinos, a collective based in Jujuy, Claudia Ibar, a textile uh, craftswoman, a randera. She lives in El Cercado in the province of Tucumán. And Sol Marinucci, a designer, a cultural producer, and the coordinator of the Crafting Futures program in Argentina. Thank you guys for being here. Sol, can you tell us about this problem, please? Uh, this program, please. Thank you. Uh, it's a real honor for us to start sharing this pro project, Voices, Voces de la Artesanía, Voices of Craftsmanship. This is something that we will start sharing in May, a project on which we've been working for the past three years. So I wanted to share with you guys how this initiative originating, it originated. It is as part of the Crafting Futures program by the British Council, which celebrates the value of craft in our history, culture, and the current world with intention of encouraging dialogues as part of an intersection between craft and other disciplines. And with this premise as a starting point in collaboration with Reddit and the Craft Revival Trust in India, we decided to embrace this project based on a very current need, which is reflecting on the necessary practices that will build a more egalitarian and sustainable future. Starting 2019, we launched a collaborative research project. There was a diagnosis stage first. Uh, there was an analysis of case studies, interviews with craftspeople, uh, anthropologists, teachers, uh, curators, etc. And this created the necessary polyphonic team that was necessary to uh, engage in these topics. So our team became uh, multiple, a team in, in, uh, involving multiple voices and experiences. And somehow we can see the result of this public Application, which focuses on the voices of craftspeople. These are people that carry the ancestral heritage and that maintain the knowledge alive. The publication is divided into sections or chapters. The first one focuses on the absolutely necessary ethical practices to connect craftspeople with the general world, uh, respect, consentment, attribution, shared benefits, protection, and active listening. And the second section works works on topics where these practices intersect with one another, such as transmission through uh, knowledge sharing, through education, tourism, ecology, and co-creation. In closing of this introduction, and in order to uh, locate ourselves in this map, through the research we opened up to the south of East, uh, to Asia, you can see the number of names of the countries right there, and thanks to the scope of the Crafting Futures program on one side of the 
uh, globe and on the other side well we, what we can really see is how universal these practices are and how we can work on mutual respect all together. Along these lines, Rita's contribution was key. Her organization, together with UNESCO, helped us a lot. It was This project is called Designers Meet Artisans. This was a project uh, with collaborations between India and Colombia. Maybe, uh, Rita, you can talk a little bit about the Craft Revival Trust and uh, well, elaborate a little bit on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Saul. So a little bit of history. In 2005, I worked on a research project with uh, Celia Duque Duque from Artisana de Colombia that culminated in a publication titled Designers Meet Artisans, a Practical Guide. Published by UNESCO and translated into French and Spanish, the volume reflected the experiences of two countries with distinct cultural identities and two completely different continents, and yet with converging lessons to be learned for mutually beneficial relationships with craftspeople and makers and practitioners across the broad spectrum of crafts and a wide range of circumstances. The publication continues to be in print and remains widely disseminated. In 2019, when I was invited to participate in the research project in Argentina, I was delighted to be of help. As the conversations with artisans and communities in Argentina uh, progressed over 2020 and 21, it became apparent that the needs and values for a healthier, sustainable, well-balanced relationship between artisans and their wider ecosystems that were expressed by makers in Argentina were very similar to the voices we heard across South Asia. And our work in the Craft Revival Trust is really researching, documenting, and disseminating these voices. So being based in South Asia and working across South Asia, and given the global reach of the British Council Crafting Futures Program, it was uh, felt that the voices, opinions, reflections of artisans from five additional countries, India, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka would actually add weight and value to what was being said and make this a more, shall I say, a global publication to say that these values are common to us all, common to humanity. And uh, by amplifying these voices, we hope, actually we hope to cover in the future far more regions, cover more countries in Latin America, cover Africa, the Far East. And we hope that in this manner, we work towards developing a more equitable, more sustainable, more respectful relationship leading to interactions that benefit all those involved. And that is why we are so delighted, Carrie, to be here on this amazing Passion Revolution platform. Because this annual platform that brings together the world's largest fashion activism movement and to hear the voices of artisans, makers, and practitioners is really something that we are grateful for. And so please let us know how you think we should continue. How do we amplify these voices? How can we continue to be part of Fashion Revolution Week? So over to you, Carrie. Thank you. 
So, I mean, just to give an introduction to fashion revolution, because I'm sure that some people listening, watching, won't know what fashion revolution is. So fashion revolution is the world's largest fashion activism movement formed after the Rana Plaza factory collapsed in Bangladesh in 2013. And we now have teams in around 100 countries around the world. And we campaign for a clean, safe, fair, transparent and accountable fashion industry through research, education, collaboration and advocating for, for policy change. And we try to scrutinise the industry's practices, we try to influence governments to better enforce laws and regulate the industry, and we also try to work to create new cultural narratives. And really, I mean, we're nine years on now from the Rana Plaza factory collapse, the event which, which inspires me to fight, found Fashion Revolution. You know, and we still see that that struggle for, for human dignity, for living wages, you know, as much for the garment workers as artisans in the fashion supply chain remains constant and costly. And we know that the environment is continuing to suffer as a result of the way in which fashion is made, sourced and consumed. And although we have seen some progress, transparency remains an essential first step in shining a light on the many people around the world who make our clothing and our accessories. Now, the fashion industry is seen as a champion of creativity, and yet it spent more than 30 years obsessed with speed, volume and identical flawless production, whilst slow ancient crafts with their individual variations are increasingly undervalued. And all too frequently, more powerful and privileged people in society inappropriately adopt the, the customs, the practices, the ideas of another culture and community without proper acknowledgement, respect, inclusion or payment. Now, for me, I think if we are to bring these traditional skills that we're going to be talking about today to the fore, it all begins with language. The word tradition seems to have come to mean the continuance of, of sort of ancient, long adopted actions, habits, customs and rights. It's come to mean something from the past. But really, the word tradition comes from two Latin words, trans meaning across and dare meaning to give. So tradition, simply put, means to hand over, to pass on to the next generation. It's a living word for living practices. A new tradition can begin today. As the classical composer Gustav Mahler once said, tradition is not the worship of ashes, but the preservation of fire. Sorry about my barking dog. Over the past two years, I've been piecing together the story of my fourth great grandmother for a novel that I'm writing. She was an exploited migrant lace maker working at the end of the 18th century. And I see her life mirroring that of thousands of invisible, undocumented lace makers and other artisans around the world and across time. And I look at the hardship, the debt, the discrimination she faced over 200 years ago. And it's really not that different from the many obstacles that are facing garment workers today as they try to work their way out of poverty. It's it's clear to me that not enough has changed and change is not happening fast enough. And these historical threads that connect me to my fourth great grandmother have made my commitment to, to the artisan story so much stronger because now it's part of my story. So just briefly, what needs to change? We need to see a shift in the relationships between brands and suppliers, between designers and makers, and we need new ways of working, which bring to the fore indigenous craftsmanship, cultural heritage, and regenerative business models. And I think in all of this, 
that collaboration and mutual support as we're seeing as part of this exciting project will be essential because we are more powerful voices for change when we all work together. And we still need supply chain transparency as a way to make visible the artisan, the processes and the craft to dignify the artisans and to differentiate the authentic product which you're making from those mass produced culturally appropriated imitations. So transparency is still an essential first step if we want to support artisans in our communities across the globe and ensure that these textile traditions remain a living way of passing on knowledge and skills from mother to daughter. And this is one of the reasons why Fashion Revolution launched the I Made Your Clothes hashtag to provide a platform for weavers, dyers, spinners, embroiderers, lace makers, and everybody else working in the supply chain to share your stories and celebrate the designs and skills that are rooted in these living and vibrant cultures. Thank you. And I'm sorry about the dog barking. Thank you so much, Carrie. Thank you, Ritu and Sol, for your kind words, which contextualize things and which allow us to understand what we are doing nowadays as part of this platform. As Carrie was saying, um, as we are joining this line or this intention of reassigning value to things, I would now like to give the floor to Celeste and to Claudia, who are craftswomen from Argentina, Jujuy and Tucumán, respectively, two provinces in the northwest of Argentina. We will have them speak about their the places that they belong, their practices and the communities that they represent right here. Thank you, girls, for being here. Celeste, you have the floor first. Good morning, my name is Celeste Valero. I am a weaver. I live in Umahuaca. This is an area in the province of Jujuy. This is one of the areas that make up the province of Jujuy. I'm sorry, but she's having some interruptions. I uh, work at the Guacalera community. That is where I work and live. There is a celebration that is held in this community, which is called the Winter Solstice Celebration. This is a celebration that involves a ceremony, which uh, involves a high degree of spirituality for our culture and our community. As I said at the beginning, I am a weaver of textile pieces in llama, vicuna, and uh, sheep fibers. I am using traditional, of course, uh, techniques such as pillars and needles and uh, embroideries. A couple of years ago, uh, my parents, I realized that my parents were like my big mentors. And there is a full generation of weavers on the side of my grandparents. And uh, that is how a dream of mine came into being. It is called Tejedores Andinos. It is something that I cannot carry out by myself. It is a shared dream, of course. Uh, as part of this project, I live and coexist with this place. This is where I live, as I mentioned before at the beginning. But I also live with other people, other weavers, both men and women. These are the people that we share experiences with. We create textile pieces with them. We do collaborations with them. We collaborate in the sale and the design of our products. So this is a network that was put together a couple of years ago. And it is an undertaking that 
uh, is a family based, but it has expanded over to other areas of the province of Hohoi. I am talking about the valley area and the Puna area. These are two uh, topographic zones where I share this knowledge that was uh, given, uh, that was passed on to me with other weavers. And thanks to the values that were passed on to me by my parents, I am capable of taking my time to share this knowledge with other people. This is what the project is about. It is about preserving ancestral techniques. Uh, it is about conserving these ancestral, ancestral techniques, and it's about conveying them as a way of rethinking this uh, and this last portion, the transmission of the ancestral techniques that have been passed on from generation to generation through uh, history and through time uh, and uh, over the past few years especially the situation has changed for a number of reasons um, the younger generations have decided to move away from their villages for different reasons and their parents grow older and older and maybe they are not able to pass on their knowledge so the Tejedores and Dinos project um, has the objective of bringing together older weavers and bringing them together with younger weavers so uh, that this practice of passing knowledge on to others may happen in the weaving circles, even if they are not mothers and daughters, even there is not even if there is not a blood relationship between them. So that's what my project is about, basically. Thank you, Celeste. Uh, now I will share uh, the statement that you shared with us for this publication uh, for voices of craft, uh, voices de la artesanía. Let's see whether this uh, statement raises uh, some questions or a dialogue based on this. So this is a, a statement that uh, is very representative of, of what is happening across different communities and practices. I wanted to know whether you can share uh, can you elaborate on, on this contribution that you made to the publication? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, what I can share in connection with this is that as part of this path of uh, creating textile pieces, it's only logical that we market these pieces. And as part of this experience, I came across lots of people who had different intentions depending on who you were dealing with. But uh, what I would like to underscore is the people with whom I've built long lasting work relationships. They are the ones that have high values that are very respectful with regard to how long it takes to create our pieces, for example. Or uh, they are also very respectful to uh, for our thoughts and our feelings when we create our textiles. Uh, they are always willing to consult with us. For example, they are open to our input. And for example, in connection with a final piece, right? Uh, you may think about creating a piece, but in practice, when it when while you're doing it, there may be different paths to get to that, and that will depend on the ability of the weavers. It will depend on the techniques uh, adopted in each place. For example, once someone showed me a design, but it was a Mapuche design. It was from another indigenous community in Argentina. I may run an experiment with it, but it's not part of my culture, you know. So there are similarities, but that Mapuche textile is not part of my roots. It's not part of my local identity. It's not part of the geography that I belong to. Uh, another experience I tend to have is that lately people have asked me about what should be written. I am also a photographer and that works for people that may be interested in marketing our products, uh, uh, show what is important for me is to show the process for me it's very valuable for people to show the process of their work not just with text but with imagery as well because just putting a piece on a model for example will not speak of the stories that underlie all of this and a picture a photograph may be quite telling you know uh, as the end consumers come to this place and are able to perceive and actually 
touch uh, the process, the, the, the work in progress in our workshops. Mm. Uh, that are consumers that may not be able to visit our workshops, but we may get them familiarized with the process through a video or a photograph. Uh, so people that are interested in marketing our products and who are interested in showing and showcasing the process, that is something that I've worked on quite a bit over the past few years. But from the outset, that is something that I have established as a condition. I've always said, Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so has done it. I have never attributed that piece to myself because I consider that pieces have a name. That is why uh, the, my project has the name that it has, because that is what I consider. I consider that the soul of craft made textile, uh, textiles of all those handmade crafts, all those products have a name, the name of their makers, their creators. In my area, it's weavers, both male and female. Uh, so I consider that that means a lot to me. It means a lot for the project. Uh, that is having an interest in visibilizing the creators of the pieces, getting people to get to develop an interest in asking how a final piece is actually obtained. Uh, like for example, the colors of the piece, what many people nowadays call co-creation. As uh, weavers, we are not manpower. We are creators. We are creative people who, uh, as we were getting ready for this meeting, uh, we were having a discussion with Claudia, oftentimes we uh, create things, not because we are commissioned to do it, it is just of our own will, and we replicate traditional drawings and traditional techniques, but we are also innovators. We are also on the road towards innovation. We are people who recreate designs, and we also recreate things that are around us and that are also part and parcel of our uh, craft. So that's the comment that I wanted to share on the statement that I shared for this publication. Thank you, Celeste. Uh, there are many issues that come up in this case. Uh, what I keep to myself is this idea that you shared just now. We are not manpower. Uh, we, it's, it's very important to adopt this perspective so as to be able to work on co-creation, uh, looking at each other in a horizontal, not vertical way. Well, everything that you've said is very valuable. Thank you so much. Before moving on to Claudia, uh, maybe uh, we can take questions for Celeste or, or inputs for Celeste. Yes, I had a question. Um, I was interested in your quote. You said that in your community, you respect the time of people and processes. And you know, that's very common from my knowledge of working for so many years, you know, two decades in the Andes. And a lot of the time when I talk to artisans, they actually had no idea how long it took them to make a product. You know, I talked to weavers who said, oh, well, it takes me a week, 10 days to make a Panama hat. Whereas actually if they sat down and made it, all in one go, it would probably, you know, it took them like eight hours, but they wouldn't believe that because of the way in which they worked. And that was valued as part of that. That process is a holistic way of working. So I wondered, you know, do your customers also respect the time that is required to make an artisanal product? And do they understand what they're paying for as a result? Or is it still a challenge, particularly when you know, so many Latin American textiles are now being copied in the Far East on machines and are then being sold back into Latin America as being you know, traditional handwoven textiles when they're made in China on machines using synthetic dyes? Thank you for your question, Carrie. As I said during my uh, intervention, we are, that is work in progress, you know, uh, we are still on the road of getting people to fully understand uh, the processes of, the, of our craft. Talking specifically about my own practice, 
There are still people who think that crafts are products, period. Uh, products are mass produced. They are produced in series and that is not the case of a craft. Quite the contrary, a craft has the particularity of, in, of, of uh, requiring an individual period of time for creation and that is subjective because it depends on each craftsman or woman. Uh, in the uh, effort of marketing our products, it is true that we need to find a way of saying, okay, it takes us this amount of time to create this or that craft. Um, and it's difficult to get people to understand that, but I do believe that these times of change that we are currently experiencing when it comes to consumers' awareness uh, are something that everyone is experiencing. And it's just perfect. It's really wonderful that it should happen at this point because that makes consumer more open to listening. People are more willing to understand. They are more willing to see, to watch, because if as individuals, if we do not have the sensitivity of listening to others, if we uh, have not developed our own human sensi sensitivity to be able to understand uh, the others, we also need to see things, to actually see to believe. Uh, for example, I've had a, one experience uh, with one person who traveled over from Germany to get to know us and to get to know this process. It is this type of sensitivity that leads someone to hop on a, to hop on a plane and to travel over here and to get all the pieces that she will then carry over to Germany and tell others about this first-hand experience that she was able to have when we've, she visited us. And uh, that, that is a way in which other people may get to know about the time that is necessary and uh, the costs and so on. But even that, the price is something that takes a second plane uh, once sensitivity is there, you know. So it's very important to share the processes, the time required, the way that people do things. I am uh, engaging on the following service. It is getting all craftspeople, weavers, etc., to get this ability of sharing with others. We should not take for granted that everyone knows what we know um, because it's important to share. And now we have the necessary tools at hand. I can take a picture with my cell phone. I can create a video as I am creating a piece. I can post it on social media and I can share what I do and the way that I do it. Thank you, Celeste. That was the end of my intervention. <laughs> I thought that you had frozen, but no, you were done. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Celeste. I think that we are talking about empathy all the time, right? We are talking about the possibility of stepping into another person's shoes and understanding that person's process and feeling those processes as going through our bodies, even if it is in a simulated way, so that we may better understand how these practices take shape. Thank you, Celeste, for what you shared. I will now give the floor to Claudia, and then we may share additional comments in connection with the two communities and the two types of practices. Welcome, Claudia. I will share, I will do some screen sharing of the images that we have on this territory, the practice and the community. Claudia, are you there? I do not see Claudia right now. You're muted, Claudia. That is why we cannot hear you. There we go. She was able to unmute herself. Wonderful. 
You're muted again, Claudia. Ahí está muteado. Ahí. Ahí, a ver. There you go. Perfecto. Now it's working. Yes, thank you. La ayudita siempre. I always, I always need some help from other people. Well, my name is Claudia Aybar. I work in El Cercado. This is a small village that is 40 kilometers away from the capital city of the province of Tucumán. El Cercado is a district in the department of Montero in the province of Tucumán. In my village, where there are around 50 randeras, these are embroiderers, and there are around 30 of these randeras embroiderers that are currently working. In uh, our village, hmm. our village is close to Ibatim. Ibatim is the place where the uh, randera, the randa technique uh, remains and still exists. This is a very important type of craft because it is part of our identity. It, it identifies us. El Cercado is the cradle of the randa because this is our own embroidery craft. It, it is really it really belongs to us so it is done with a needle and with a little stick and you can do the randa with both very thin um, strings and very thick ones we have a collar for example which was embroidered by myself you, you can see that the holes are there the embroidery on top of the net and at home i have a little workshop where the various embroiderers get together. We hold meetings with the National University of Tucumán. Uh, and there are several people that come over, visit us, and uh, that come uh, to check out uh, how we work on the randa, this type of embroidery. So we also work together with the communal delegate. This is like a member of the city council who always makes contributions when it comes to our craft. Uh, the randeras are a team. Uh, for example, there are 30 randeras that are currently working together. We um, take uh, commissions, we create the products that are commissioned to us and we send them over to destination, to wherever uh, the commissioner lives. And uh, we are like little spiders because we always weave our spider web. Uh, so we create a net first and we create the embroidery on top of that net or web. And in the past, for example, we used to create uh, kerchiefs or handkerchiefs or little rugs, but then we uh, moved on to transform our craft and we started to bring forth new ideas to create other types of crafts. So nowadays we work together as a collective and and we get help from everywhere, honestly, because uh, like, for example, the Minister of Culture is always supporting us. He's always giving us a hand so that we may be able to market our crafts. And well, social media as well are so useful. They have been very useful. Uh, scholarships as well, uh, which always uh, contribute uh, things of value for our community. The randeras are constantly embroidering. Uh, they spend most of the day embroidering. Uh, not many of them make a living just out of the embroidery. It's a very slow piece of work. It takes time, so you cannot make ends meet just by embroidering. But there are some of them that do. Uh, so uh, we always try to give a hand to the randeras that just make their living out of the embroideries. Uh, so, well, this is a picture that shows us in El Cercado. This is our uh, village. This is our little corner on earth. Uh, it is the cradle of the randas, we always say. And well, not all of the randeras are in the picture, but there are several randeras in the picture who are uh, 
ladies of a certain age, uh, there are randeras, there are some randeras that are 80 or even older, and there are younger randeras in the picture. There are randeras that are only 15, for example, and they are currently in the process of learning to um, embroider and they are embroidering together with us. For us, it's a real privilege, a real source of pride to be representatives of this craft. And our dream is to be able to showcase it and to move forward because this is a craft that is passed on, that has been passed on from generation to generation. And our goal is, of course, to continue to be able to convey the technique to the younger generations. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. I would, in, in conclusion of this particular presentation, I would like to share the statement that Claudia shared with us for the publication in connection with cooperation. You can see it on screen. Claudia, can you um, elaborate on this statement? Well, I've had several experiences with designers. Some of them were good, others were not so good, but now the experiences are all good because, well, we say uh, stumbling does not mean falling in Spanish. So I worked with this designer called Gonzalo Villamax. Uh, at the beginning, all the randeras here, the older ones especially, were thinking that they could just create like uh, a rug or a kerchief or uh, something to put on, on top of a table. And... Um, the designers came over and we started working as a team. I've had a very interesting experience with Gonzalo Villamar. I, uh, for example, I was an expert in uh, embroidering colors. So when he saw a piece, for example, uh, he would say, well, this piece belongs to Claudia. This is a Claudia creation because he uh, taught me to work, that is to say, uh, he, he taught me that uh, having uh, designers contribute to our craft was something very important because we, for example, started working on patterns. Um, we worked with his ideas, with our ideas, which was really good. So the experience was very positive on my side. Maybe the experience was not so good for the other randeras, maybe because it was uh, they were these were the initial experiences and they did not uh, try again as I did. Um, then there was something that was just amazing. It was revolutionary for me, making it to the runway in Buenos Aires with this fashion brand, Clara Rosa. Clara Rosa is a Tucuman brand, and I was able to make it to the runway in Buenos Aires. That was a dream. Um, all of the clothes that were showcased in the runway, all of them involved uh, the Randa technique, uh, involved my own work, my own craft. So for me, this was a beautiful experience. And we continue to work with designers, I continue to collaborate with designers because this experience was really beautiful and it was a beautiful way of learning for me as well. And that is why I still engage with designers because I learned a lot of lessons and hopefully they learned from me because I also taught them to the technique. And so it was a beautiful experience to work together. Wonderful, Claudia. Yes, I think that sometimes it is complicated to build relationships with other professions, but with the passage of time, well, you know, it happens in life in general, in your family, with a couple, whatever, you uh, nourish that relationship and uh, that gives birth to positive experiences. Thank you, Claudia, for your input. Thank you for sharing your beautiful, precious practice. Uh, thank you, Celeste. And now we will open it up for questions and comments on what both Claudia and Celeste have just shared. Ritu? Yes, I, I actually, in where I live and work in South Asia, one of the biggest challenges we face is many artisanal practices are now being copied and faked by power by machine. And it is very adversely impacting craftspeople 
because they have the marketing might to also sell and disseminate their products far more widely and at far lower costs. And artisans have not enough recourse to fight against these larger players in the market. So I would want to know if this is a similar situation that you face on the ground in Argentina. And if either Claudia or Celeste has faced this situation in their work. See, see, see. Yes, yes, we did face this situation on several occasions because there are a lot of imitations of the Randera's work, and this is industrial work. I always say that our machines are our hands. What we do, we do it stitch by stitch in our embroidery and our embroidery is highly original it our handwork is clearly seen in the final uh, outcome and uh, it really bothers us to see that there are sometimes industrial products going around that have been created with a machine and because of that they are a lot cheaper and people sometimes feel inclined to buy something that is cheaper of course rather than to really become aware of the effort that is involved in an actual craft but in a handmade craft such as the ones that we create. I don't know whether I've answered your question, Rita. Well, I have a similar experience right here in Jujuy, northwest of Argentina. There is disloyal competition, unfair uh, competition by industrial production. These people call themselves craftsmen, but you will uh, really, they wrongfully call themselves craftsmen. You will see this in the squares of Yumawaka. And these crafts or these products are not even close to the iconography, the drawings and the colors that represent our uh, geography, our area of the Puna, the Quebrada in Jujuy. Then there is another area that I do not, I'm not so familiar with. This is the Junga area. This is like a tropical forest. I do not know their textile identity so well because I've not visited the, those areas so much. But talking about the areas that, that I'm familiar with and the weavers that I work with, well, this is what we have. We are suffering unfair competition on the side of the industry. It's really annoying to get this competition because the prices that uh, are offered by these industrialized products, because these are products, because they are produced, uh, they are mass produced, they are similar, they are completely industrial. There is no artisanal perfection involved in them. There is industrial perfection rather, which is uh, attractive for some people because there are people that love for a product to be really symmetrical, to have exactly the same color as another product that they intend to buy. But that in truth, that has absolutely nothing to do with artisanal work, with craft, uh, because anyone will realize that. But we are experiencing a recurrent reality, uh, which uh, leads to the fact that people are ignorant of that. There are people that think that there are alpacas in Jujuy. Of the four South American camelids, we only have three species here. If there are alpacas in this area, it is because they have been transferred from a, an area for the north in Bolivia. We have vicunas, we have llamas, and we have guanacos. The vicuna is a sacred camelid, a sacred animal for our culture. So we do very few, we create very few crafts based on vicuna. There is not much artisanal production based on this vicuna fiber because they are a sacred animal. And with regard to the guanaco, uh, there are areas which uh, the guanaco lives in areas that are not so, so accessible uh, geographically. And we have llama and we also have sheep as well. Uh, that is what we use the most. And on the squares of the of our villages and cities, there are lots of industrial products going around. They are called regional products. They cost 
25% of what a craft really costs. And uh, they have drawings of Aymara culture. These are industrialized drawings and uh, they, with the salespeople say that these products are made of alpaca, but that is between inverted commas. Uh, so uh, the uh, crafts people themselves have taught me to recognize, to identify the alpaca fiber. This is very similar to the llama fiber, but they have taught me to recognize this and recognize it in textile products. How can you really recognize the fiber and where, what, from what animal it comes from just by touching it? And undoubtedly, the uh, products that are so manufactured, they do not have natural fiber in them. Uh, or maybe they have 20 or 30% of a natural fiber. Same thing for other fashion products that have like 20 to 30% of cotton and that's it. Thank you, Celeste. Yes, that's so true. And I think we need designer education as well because I remember taking fashion designers out from the UK to work with artisans and they would you know come back with what they called you know alpaca knitwear and I'm like that's hardly got any alpaca in it that's synthetic how do you how can you not tell that that's synthetic so I think it looks you know we need, we need that education I think the whole Hello. world across the, the the value chain you know as much with the, the buyers um i was wondering you know, my family are lace makers on both sides so i was really interested here claudia's story so both my mother and my father come from lace making families and i've been passed down so many stories of how hard it was for them to earn a living and you highlighted a few good experiences of working with designers, but you also mentioned that you had some poor experiences. I'm sure both of you have. Fashion Revolution ran a really excellent webinar last year with the Cultural Intellectual Property Initiative, who talked about the three C's, consent, credit, and compensation. And I wondered, what do you think is the key to a positive collaboration with a larger brand or designer? For me, right now, in order for me to be able to work with a designer, I we, we always try to make his or her work compatible with my work so that we may arrive at a good product product at a good price and uh, so that both of us are protagonists of this creation as well uh, the goal is for the piece to carry both our names and uh, the names of our crafts as well uh, because the goal is equality here That is what we always request when it comes to working with designers right now, because in the past, for example, for example, when I spoke about the poor experiences that I had with designers, it was this was at the beginning. Beginning, my colleagues also worked with designers, and uh, as for example, it was the designer that took the better cut uh, of the deal, you know. Uh, so my colleagues uh, found that the work with the designers was not going to be very profitable for them. So they were not keen on working with them. And that was my experience at the beginning. But then we went into discussions and we went deeper into this topic and we decided to engage in a discussion with the various designers and that is how we were able to create a better product and a better sale for both of us uh, and uh, well we've all we always get them to name us as craftswomen on each piece uh, 
And well, this is absolutely necessary, right? To have a dialogue so as to establish the various agreements, getting to know one another, active listening. Empathy is going to originate from active listening as well, understanding how each party would like to collaborate, how they would like to be mentioned, etc. So throughout our discussions, all of this originates and this creative tension that originates as we meet with the other party, whether it be a designer or this person that Celeste mentioned who came over from Germany uh, and, and who got the experience of checking out how long it took firsthand. And this creates you, the own capacity of ascribing value to what you are creating. Uh, Celeste, I think that it would be good uh, for you to answer this question as well, the question that was posed. Uh, just now, you mean uh, in connection with experiences with designers, uh, what should happen to make these experiences positive? Of course, a more fluid relationship based on conversations, I think that makes the basis for all human relationships, being able to discuss what we feel, what we do, and how we are going to do things. I believe that it's not that this is a need of our own, just a need of our own. I think that it is a need on the other person's side as well, uh, you know, being listened to. Neither of the parties should impose ideas, by this I mean that it's not that we, it's not just ourselves that need to be listened to, designers also need to be listened to. We need to see each other on an equal footing. Um, as Claudia was saying, both of us should take a cut on a piece, uh, something that is convenient for both of us. And I'm not just talking about the money. I am talking about uh, this idea of feeling that we are doing something that is shared with one another, uh, that both parties value each other. I think that everything is necessary. We are all necessary when it comes to conveying values that go above and beyond the fact of just creating pieces. We need to convey values that are nothing about individualism, but on the contrary, about collective work, about co-creating, about listening to the other person. So these are values that need to be uh, applied so that we may be able to restore a world that has been uh, affected by for so many centuries because of individualism, because of selfishness. Uh, environmental damages have been created because um, humankind has thought that we were alone on Earth. Uh, but the truth is that there are many, many others that are not having a good time at this point. And I think that working together as part of a collective is the solution. And that has to do with the relationship with designers. That is, these are global or comprehensive concepts that can be applied specifically to relationships with designers. In my family and in my community, these are basic values. It's a, it's a given, it's, uh, we have always uh, consulted with others. We have always respected our mother earth. We have always respected the time that takes, that it takes to create something. It is something that does not escape our worldview. There is no way in which we can think about individualism. This is based on the values that were passed on to me by my family. And this is also based on the collective values of my community. Thinking about the other person is something that comes naturally across everything that we do. So that is something that will necessarily reflect itself in whatever relationship we undertake. Thank you, Celeste. Yes, I think that we've seen this in your presentation as well, even though uh, both of you are here, Sol and Cl um, Celeste and Claudia, you are the representatives of several voices of other crafts people that are here with you in a way. Uh, so your voice is a collective voice. It's not an individual voice. That is clear enough. And it's really uh, 
touching to listen to you to you guys we can hear your voices quite loud we have a lot to learn on all sides i'm always feel touched by seeing you and by listening to you by seeing your work uh, by seeing you share your work so thank you so much thank you uh, we have uh, we have already arrived at the end of this meeting of course there is more to be discussed but i'm sure we'll have other opportunities thank you so much carrie ritu claudia sol celeste thank you to our interpreter emilia and thank you to the technical guys uh, who are behind the scenes thank you mimi thank you moriani moriana thank you so much everyone and thank you ali